tarda. Bona tarda a tothom. Em plau de donar-vos a tots la benvinguda a aquesta casa, al Banc de Sabadell, al nostre auditori, per aquesta reunió de la Barcelona Red School of Economics. I simplement anunciar-vos que tenim prevista una lecture d'una hora aproximadament i després 15 minuts, poder més, de preguntes i respostes i després una petita recepció amb una copa de cava aquí al costat que si voleu acompanyar-nos estarem encantats de tenir-vos aquí fins que acabeu de parlar entre vosaltres. Más idiomas hacemos? En inglés, perfecto. Y con esto paso la palabra al representante de la Barcelona Graduate School en esta reunión para que haga la presentación del ponente de hoy y del profesor Jack Strauss. Merci. I would like to thank you all for being here to listen Jack Dress tonight. It's it's for me a privilege and an honor to introduce uh, Jack to you. Uh, Professor Dres has distinguished himself not only by his enormous scientific contribution, but also by his contribution to uh, the uh, development of research over Europe and the, uh, the uh, debate, the uh, discussion on, on important economic policy issues. Um, his contribution to economic science has been exceptional, opening up new paths of uh, research in uh, Varietes areas uh, that go from uh, general equilibrium theory to decision theory, theory of contracts, economics of uncertainty, game theory, econometrics, in particular uh, in Bayesian econometrics, operational research, macro and economic policy. Uh, Professor Dres has been president of the uh, Econometric Society as well as co editor of Econometrica. He was the first president of the European Economic Association and president of the International Economic Association. He is honorary member of the American Economic Association, the American Academy of Arts and Science, and he has received honorary uh, doctorate from uh, 12 universities, including uh, Chicago University. Um, Jack is, uh, among many things, a convinced European, and maybe that's the reason why he uh, he's here today. And And, he started his career uh, having a lot of opportunities in a, going back to, to Belgium, uh, and where he created the, the Center for Operation Research and, uh, and Econometrics Core that uh, is today and was likely in the past the most important research center in continental Europe. Uh, he was also at the, one of the uh, funding members of the European Doctoral Program and the Barcelona GSC, if you compare with other member of uh, his uh, the first uh, European doctorate uh, program. And uh, he has actively participated in debates on the most pressing problems uh, uh, of the European economy, among them unemployment, the pension system, uh, university reform, and many other things. Uh, Jack has, for many of, of us, in, in particular for me, been uh, an example, and not only in terms of his uh, research uh, career, but in terms of his uh, contribution to, uh, to, uh, to the research uh, institutions and to, to the, the society. Um, and he has uh, conveyed with passion, uh, his passion to, for, for research to all of us, and, and, and I would like in, in uh, my name and in the name of many of us here to, to thank you uh, very much. The, uh, today he will talk about the, uh, the, uh, the current uh, European crisis and he will make a proposal on the, on the ways we can and we hope we, we find a way out of it. Uh, thank you very much. As you know, <coughs> there was an important meeting in Brussels uh, 
Friday, Saturday of last week, the European Council and the Euro Summit. And uh, prior to these meetings uh, had circulated uh, a report by uh, Van Rompuy, Barroso, Draghi and Juncker. And uh, one was uh, hoping that this uh, report would lead to important policy decisions. And there had been much uh, uh, interesting that uh, the time had come to be less concerned about uh, austerity and more concerned about restoring roads. So we were hoping that maybe sometime during these two days, uh, President Van Rompuy would call the press and uh, claim, Habemus program. <laughs> we have a program. But if you look at uh, what people commented afterwards, uh, you see that, uh, no, there was no program. There are uh, various views on the extent to which uh, there may be a change in the mood of the policymakers, but nothing specific, nothing precise, nothing carrying a genuine promise of uh, <coughs> growth being uh, close uh, for Europe. Now, <coughs> what kind of statement would one have liked to hear? And here I quote a paper which uh, I wrote with my friend uh, Alain Duré, and of which uh, <coughs> the content was uh, presented for the first time. You know where? Well, in Barcelona, of course, where else? Uh, on the occasion of uh, what was to be a debate with uh, Bob Lucas and Ed Prescott, uh, but there was no time for debate. <laughs> and uh, the view uh, taken <coughs> in that uh, paper and uh, presented a year ago is there is no alternative to an ambitious European investment program as a way out of the current recession, which the prevailing austerity measures deepen and prolong. Now, that is one of the three uh, policy statements developed in the paper to which you hear have the reference uh, together with uh, a proposal to organize international sharing of macroeconomic risks through mutual insurance, and uh, a third proposal to let <coughs> member countries of the Eurozone issue sovereign debt indexed on their national incomes. These three proposals complement each other, and uh, we view them as uh, an answer to the challenges that are faced both by the monetary union uh, uh, with the implications of idiosyncratic national macroeconomic shocks that have created problems, no need to give details uh, in Spain, uh, and uh, <coughs> that uh, would uh, thus put the monetary union on more solid ground. Uh, I understand that we had one hour, of which there may be 50 some minutes left, and uh, I would like uh, to share this time with you, and in particular to hear your reactions to this blunt statement 
that uh, an international investment program is the only way of going beyond the current recession into renewed growth. So I will uh, try to be as brief as possible in my presentation. Uh, <coughs> what uh, <coughs> is uh, specific to <coughs> the paper, incidentally, that paper should be available uh, on the core website uh, momentarily. The only way, a uh, reason why it is not today is that the secretary in charge of discussion papers has been sick for several weeks, but hopefully uh, it will be there soon. Uh, we start from general equilibrium theory uh, in an area where most people start from macroeconomics of one kind or another. Uh, we see no conflict or contradiction between these two avenues, uh, but uh, we stress that uh, the general equilibrium analysis uh, uh, remains today limited to certain topics, and one needs to extend it through macroeconomic models uh, to go in particular into dynamics. I don't think that I need to remind this audience in details of what the general equilibrium approach consists of. Uh, it starts with describing an economy as a set of households who consume commodities, supply labor, a set of firms that produce the commodities and employ the labor, <coughs> a set of financial intermediaries, a public, se public sector that levies taxes and issues uh, transfers and the central bank, the commodities and labor are traded on markets. The firms are owned by households, either directly as private firms or through shares of stock traded on stock markets together with other assets. <coughs> Macroeconomic models typically fit into that general framework but rely on more specific assumptions or on uh, specific forms of aggregation uh, to permit the kind of uh, uh, dynamic uh, analysis that uh, the general framework uh, does not uh, lead to. <coughs> now, the general equilibrium model assumes that uh, uh, the economy operates over time, and that time brings in uncertainty, and uh, the uncertainties are of different nature, like political developments, what will be the next Italian government, uh, technological developments, uh, what will be done about schist uh, energy, and so on and uh, there is progressive information over these events. And the basic assumption that there would be trading at any point in time on markets for commodities traded contingently on any of the events that is assume, assuming a complete set of insurance markets whereby, for instance, today you can trade any commodity contingent on the taxes that will be levied in Cyprus uh, on bank accounts uh, 
and whatnot. Uh, more importantly, someone like me might be interested in markets on which you can trade contingently on the Belgian pension systems being reformed. Uh, if there are complete insurance markets, uh, then uh, the welfare analysis uh, is reasonably straightforward and uh, competitive clearing of all the markets uh, sustains Pareto efficiency, that is allocations on which it is impossible to improve for anyone except at the expense of someone else. <coughs> now, uh, in the real world, markets are incomplete. We do not have a full set of uh, insurance markets for any commodities contingently on uh, any event. Uh, most risks are not tradable, and as a consequence, the welfare theorem fails to hold because it rests crucially on the existence of a full set of markets. Now, this has a number of important uh, implications. Uh, uh, of which uh, three are the following. First, market incompleteness is a source of volatility in aggregate <coughs> demand. And the reason is uh, immediate. Uh, if there is scope for new information to come in that you have not been able to trade upon previously, then waiting for the new information may be beneficial for savers who will allocate their saving both between consumption and uh, accumulation and between assets. They will do this better when they have better information and similarly, the investors <coughs> will benefit from better information to uh, choose their investment programs. So that uh, the simple prospect of being more informed today is enough to generate additional savings, less investment, that is disequilibrium between savings and investment at the macroeconomic level. Second uh, important implications, incomplete markets breed wage and price rigidities. Now the simplest and clearest illustration of this is downwards wage rigidities to protect workers from the collapse of the market clearing wages that uh, would occur in the absence of these rigidities. Just think of what the wages for low skilled workers in Europe would be today if there were no minimum wages and no unemployment benefits. And one can uh, extend this discussion uh, to the production of commodities. Uh, there are clearly second best wage price rigidities that are due to uncertainty and market incompleteness. And this in turn leads to uh, multiple equilibria, uh, again, if we think about 
the current level of activity and employment that we have today, uh, it is not determined as the unique equilibrium of a system. It is the result of uh, <coughs> the sequence of events, of the uh, process of information that uh, is led to one specific equilibrium arising today. What will be the levels of activity and employment next year? There are possibilities, there is a whole range, not a unique uh, outcome reflecting this uh, a multiplicity of equilibria. <coughs> now, knowing that uh, some of the price rigidities are second best in proving relative to what competitive market clearing would do, one wonders, of course, uh, how does one cope efficiently with uncertainties and market incompleteness. And uh, uh, the central result in this area goes back to Karl Borg in 1960. Uh, I look at my watch and I realize that uh, <coughs> I am not uh, up to what I should try to achieve. So uh, let me just uh, briefly remind you that uh, uh, this basic theorem which Karl Borg worked on because he was interested in uh, co-insurance, uh, states that uh, if a number of economic agents own risky prospects are faced with risk, an efficient way of reallocating risks calls for pooling all the risks of all the agents in a single pool and then allocating among all the agents shares of the aggregate. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is of course where uh, one sees that the extent of risk pooling that exists today is very far from the objective this theorem, uh, the most obvious instance being, again, the Eurozone and the lack of risk sharing among the member countries of the zone. It is interesting to compare the situation in the Eurozone with the situation in big federal uh, nations like the United States or Canada or even Germany, the extent of risk sharing across national borders is very small in Europe, is 30, 40, 45 percent in the large uh, federations. So here is uh, one uh, illustration of uh, a corollary to the basic uh, theorem on efficient risk pooling, which says if you want to pool all the risks that a set of agents uh, own and then redistribute, you can do that in stages. For instance, in the European Monetary Union, you could let the risks borne by individuals <coughs> be handled domestically, the subsidiarity principle, but then organize 
mutual insurance across the member countries where you pool all the national risks and redistribute them. And then after this macro redistribution, let the individual countries continue domestically. Now that is one example of how the two-stage application of efficient risk sharing works. Another very important application concerns intergenerational risk sharing. And this is, of course, uh, <coughs> where the issue of uh, fiscal stance and public debt comes in. Uh, clearly, the advantages of risk pooling apply across generations. When, for instance, uh, Haiti is hit by a tsunami, it is desirable to spread over a number of uh, generations the cost of coping with this in the same way that uh, European countries uh, uh, let the cost of world wars be spread over a number of generations. <coughs> now, this must be done by the public sector because individuals are not in a position to implement intergenerational risk sharing, at least in most places. Why? <clears throat> if I want to share risks with my heirs and bad risks materialize, I would leave them a negative bequest, which they can simply refuse to accept and there is no way to force them to do so, so there is no <coughs> safe approach to risk sharing across generations by individuals. It is done by states through the public debts. So, what is the link between intergenerational risk sharing and the public debt? Well, clearly, if a generation faces a risk and can share this risk with later generations, uh, and the later generations do likewise, then the size of the risk borne by each generation will diminish. It is enough that the risks of successive generations not be perfectly correlated, and then taking a share of the mean implies a lower variance for everybody. So intergenerational risk sharing through the fiscal stance and the public debt is a very natural step to take. But of course, besides the risk sharing, there is also a redistribution issue across generations. And the reason why there is so much concern nowadays about the size of the public debt of uh, various countries is the fear that this is transferring to future generations uh, <coughs> negative uh, uh, assets, uh, whereas uh, it would be natural uh, to ask that the transfers be non-negative. If you want to take a very simple criterion of intergenerational 
equity, fairness, efficient distribution, you would say, try to make sure that the consumption levels of this generation remain possible for the next generation, and so on. And that would define a principle on the basis of which uh, to ascertain whether an intergenerational distribution is acceptable. Uh, if you look at uh, the way to manage the public sector and public finance in this light, you would say first the intergenerational redistribution is a matter of structural policies. We should have tax and transfer and public goods uh, systems such that the successive generations are treated fairly, at least on average. There will be some risks that cannot be avoided, and these risks can be absorbed by temporary excess deficits, provided, of course, that there also exist excess surpluses in the good years. And that would seem to fully specify how the public finances of a country should be run. But if that is the case, and if a country or set of countries is faced by adverse developments leading to the choice of an inefficient equilibria, what can you do to uh, move out of the recession? And the answer, I think, is fairly clear and simple. And it says, if you have a public policy aimed at correct redistribution and risk sharing across generations, that leaves you free to add policies that are neutral from the viewpoint of intergenerational redistribution. And what are these policies? Well, investments that are economically valid, can be financed by borrowing, and you transfer to the next generations the physical investment and the corresponding debt. But if the investments are valid, they match each other so that for the next generation it makes no difference. Now, this very simple but very useful observation has been ignored by the European Union in its approach to public finance. In the Maastricht Treaty, one looks at the fiscal stance as measured by the surplus of deficit of the public sector, adding the current account and the capital account without making the distinction between the two. And that means that if a country engages in public investments, they will enter the Maastricht account as a deficit, irrespective of the value of the investment and of the transfer to the next generation. Nonsense. And similarly, 
when Maastricht looks at public debt, it doesn't ask what may be the counterpart of this public debt. And as a result, uh, individual countries are not allowed by the European rules to engage in public investments financed by borrowing that could help stimulate the economy. Now, individual countries will seldom wish to do that because individual countries are very open and if they engage in aggregate stimulation, that will benefit the neighboring countries through the imports connected to the expansion and the expanding country will suffer a current account uh, deterioration. So it has to be an international program at some level. It would be nice to do that at the level of the European Union, but uh, before we get unanimity approval of such a program, much time will go by. So what one could hope for is that at the level of the Eurozone, joint responsibility for demand stimulation when it is clearly needed, as is the case today, this joint responsibility be exercised at the level of the Eurozone. Could this make a difference to the current situation? That is asking the question, how sizable could a program of public investment at the Eurozone level be? And in the paper to which I gave the reference and uh, which I have uh, given up following through the <coughs> PowerPoint, uh, uh, we report on a study of three domains where we think it would make sense to define public investment programs at the Eurozone level, namely renewable energies, transportation, and social housing. Now, we have chosen these domains because a number of basic uh, features uh, should be satisfied. Uh, if I want to connect again with my slides, uh, why not? Uh, <coughs> the main point is that these investments be economically valid. <laughs> one should be able to identify additional investments that are not already decided because that would not add anything to the current demand uh, situation. One would like to uh, favor labor-intensive projects. One would like to be able to assess whether <coughs> certain domains suffer from externalities not taken into account by the private sector. A very clear example is if you talk about uh, social housing, that's a labor-intensive uh, sector. Today, the social cost of unskilled labor is much lower than the private cost. The difference is the taxes and social security contributions that enter the private cost, the unemployment benefits that uh, have to be paid in case of unemployment. 
So in a case like this, there is a clear gap between the private cost and the social cost, and that could become a temporary subsidy that would be fiscally neutral and that uh, could uh, be used to stimulate the private investments. Now, to be very brief, what we conclude from our study of these three sectors is that the prospects for public investment programs are considerable, of the order of one and a half to two trillion euros for the Eurozone, corresponding to 12 to 15 million man years of employment. 15 million is about the unemployment level of the Eurozone today. So you see that the possibilities opened by just three sectors indicate that this is worth looking at. So let me then ask you, do you share this proposition that one could start a process of return to growth and return to more employment through a public investment program defined at the level of the Eurozone, possibly funded by Eurobonds, at any rate uh, exempting the countries which currently cannot raise uh, uh, loan money from participating in the funding. But if we want to do it at the level of the Eurozone, it is possible to organize uh, such funding. Do you share my view, our view, that this could be done and would make a difference? Do you know of realistic alternatives? Do you know of other ways to get a growth process started again? So that's the first question. Second question, have you heard this proposal before? Except perhaps in Barcelona a year ago when I took part in this short debate, but that was very fast. Uh, we have not found explicit proposals of that nature. And we are very surprised of this. If this is such a natural and obvious suggestion, why is it not on the table? Why is it not mentioned in the report of Van Rompuy, Barroso, Draghi, and Juncker, who insist on the need to go beyond austerity and promote growth, but no reference to an international public investment program. What is the economic profession in Europe up to today if it is not discussing actively the policies that could pull us out of the recession? Where are we failing in the communication process? Should academic economists write more in the Financial Times the way that some of our American colleagues write in the New York Times? Is that what we should be doing? Should we hold more... Uh, research seminars on these issues at the European level? Uh, <coughs> should we concentrate on the diffusion of economic policy 
in the political circles. Uh, I'm asking you, what would be your suggestion for a more effective uh, involvement of the economic profession in the much needed process of suggesting the policies that will help us out of this crisis. Now, if I want to leave a little time for the audience, I have to stop here without dealing with the mutual insurance uh, policy proposal, but you will have access to the full paper on the core uh, uh, site uh, as soon as the secretary in charge recovers, uh, hopefully soon. So I am asking you, do you support this proposal? Do you know alternatives? Why is it not uh, discussed specifically more widely? And where does the economic profession stand in its responsibility towards the right economic policies today? You yeah. have the word. I mean, just now, I think we are in trouble. That's not the standard way. Normally, we ask questions to you, and now you are asking yeah. questions to us. Yes. I, mean, I, I hope my colleague will help me uh, provide an answer. Uh, no? I, <laughs> I thought you were just a... Uh, well, I think one simple question would be, who shares the view that an international public investment program could help substantially to start the growth process again. Those who share or approve this view, raise your hand. <laughs> well, uh, now those who know alternatives, <laughs> raise your hand. Now, this is a tricky question because you realize if you raise your hand, you will be asked to explain. <laughs> but uh, is there really no alternative known to anyone here? Perhaps not fully shared by the person, but known as being held as an alternative by at least some? I think one of the big problems we are facing is that we're not letting markets to work. We're, not, we're, we're debating not. for letting just the economy to work. And we're debating what the rules are. We were debating now for many years. And we don't know that uh, there is a Cyprus situation where there's a new rule coming and that perhaps will be implemented. I don't know. We're debating if we will implement the rule that we have just created. And, uh, I think that there is another way of approaching the problem. It's just that we are not running things uh, in the good way. You know. You are, so you are asking for alternatives. It. So you know. then the alternative is to restructure the operations of European authorities. No, no. The, that's the debate. The debate that the big issue in Europe now is there we did a big mistake, we thought we were richer than we are, or what we were, and now somebody has to pay the bill. And we are just discussing about who will pay the bill. But then we are covering it on the discussion of the reforming institution, but that's not the point. The point is the Germans would like the, uh, the Mediterranean country to pay the bill, we likely uh, have the opposite view, and, and the, all the debate on the uh, reform of Europe is just hiding the debate of who will pay the bill. I would say then let the bill be paid, and then the economy will go up. That's, that, I take it as the opposite view. Uh, <coughs> to summarize, you are suggesting we should solve the financial crisis first and not worry about the real economy for the time being. No, you ask it for an alternative. And I say that would be perhaps both things together. I don't know. 
But I, I think this oh, is... It, I have it, no it, objection to working on the financial side okay. at the same time. No objection at all. Uh, I'm not an expert on exactly what should be done by who, how, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'm convinced that without a policy with effects on the real economy, we will not move out of the recession. But I'm not at all discouraging anybody from working on the financial side and so on. I do not think that that is necessary as a prior step for what we are suggesting. Okay. Can, can I have a question? <laughs> Can I try to go back to the standard approach of uh, asking questions to your speaker from the audience? <laughs> so you seem to be saying that there is like a very good market opportunity that Europeans somehow miss to take advantage of. My question is, if there is such a market opportunity, such a good opportunity, why not other player, maybe China, maybe another rich player, is taking advantage of it? Do we need to do it ourselves, Europeans? You mean, why not rely on China At to come. implement a public investment program in Europe? If it is so good, they will get the, all the return. <coughs> well, uh, there are, of course, clearly elements that can only be done by the Europeans themselves. When I said a minute ago, if you create jobs in the construction industry, you can subsidize them in a fiscally neutral way from the uh, income tax, social contributions, that you will collect and unemployment benefits you will no longer pay. The Chinese are not part of that. And uh, there is no uh, hope that they would come in. Uh, insofar as uh, the private investment end of what might be a public program, for instance, in the renewable energy sector. Of course, uh, uh, the equipment that used to be invested in solar energy in Spain and that uh, is now no longer invested by Spain and no longer produced, some of that could come from China, no objection. But uh, if we want to implement faster than currently expected the program adopted by Europe for the share of renewable energy in total energy production in 2020, 40, 50, etc., we should have a program that uh, we define, I think. The Chinese will not uh, take an interest in that. And uh, if we look at the way they invest in Africa, uh, it is fairly clear that it is in their own interest and not uh, on the basis of what are the local needs. No, you want reactions uh, very quickly. Uh, I'm sure that uh, building uh, windmills, uh, trains, and housing uh, would help. Uh, although I wonder how exactly e is it going to be uh, financed, uh, euro bonds. Uh, we are very far from that, and this links me to think that maybe previous to. Uh, to the investment programs, that is the issue of risk uh, sharing. And that uh, risk sharing alone uh, would 
uh, be very positive to give uh, to give an example if you want a stimulus in Spain uh, let the unemployment insurance be paid by the Germans uh, that alone would be a push into the Spanish economy of three percent and in the future we'll pay the Germans uh, when they have a, okay. an asymmetric shock uh, so um, <coughs> So you are asking me to cover the next section of the paper. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, let me be, be very brief on this. We have a very definite suggestion for organizing mutual risk sharing among Eurozone member countries, seen as a pure risk-sharing operation with no ex-ante redistributive properties. And uh, we think that uh, we can define it in a way that uh, is immune to moral hazard. Now, when I spoke here in Barcelona a year ago, I mentioned moral hazard, which you cannot discuss an insurance problem without addressing moral hazard. And I said, let's hope that this issue is not so severe on the basis of the experience of the federal nations like US, Germany, etc., where there is a form of mutual insurance and no indication that it is defeated by moral hazard. But we have in the meantime developed our proposal in a different way, namely to implement it in annual installments. That is, each year the Eurozone member countries issue debt 12 years maturity indexed on their national income for 3% of the national income and exchange these for that indexed on the aggregate Eurozone national income. So this is a clean risk sharing exchange your own risk against a share of the aggregate, Borges theory. But if you do this by annual installments, the moral hazard problem becomes reversed. The moral hazard problem would say, if you have sold part of your national income to the community, you are no longer eager to keep up your national income. And you may do things like uh, early retirement that will reduce the measured income, but let the others pay a share of this. Well, in the installment scheme, if you did this today, then you know that next year, when you sell your 3%, they will sell for less because you have let down your national income. And through this simple device of uh, implementation by installments, you eliminate the moral hazard problem. And I think you have a definitely feasible, pure risk-sharing scheme uh, where there is only one difficulty that you have to face, and that is how do you define the exchange rate between bonds indexed on the Spanish national income and bonds indexed on the Eurozone aggregate national income. That is uh, not easy. There are no observable market data that you can use. Uh, what has been suggested, in particular 
by Van Rompuy et al., but not in connection with insurance, in connection with economic policies in general, is that uh, when the European Union tries to convince a country that it should follow a certain policy, like convincing all of us today to limit the uh, fiscal gap, mm -hmm. this could be incorporated in a contract that has broader meaning. And that means that when next year Spain discusses with the Eurozone the terms of exchange between 12 years bonds indexed on Spanish national income and 12 year bonds indexed on EU national income, the Eurozone could say if you adopt the policies that we recommend on structural parameters of taxes and benefits, for instance, then we will contract at the following rate of exchange. But if you do not accept the suggestion, the terms of exchange will be less favorable. Now, I'll tell you, I would be ready to start a program like this on a very simple basis. Look at those Eurozone members where the national income per capita is below Eurozone average. And look at the countries where it is above. We will anticipate that the countries with incomes below the average will catch up slowly, but regularly. We don't know at what speed in euros, because that depends on how the mean will evolve. But in this scheme, you don't need to forecast the mean. You are only concerned with deviations from the mean. I would be happy to go with uh, an assumption that for the countries with national income per capita below the mean, there will be a catch-up rate of one half of one percent per year. And on that basis, everything is set and we have the terms of trade for these bond exchanges. Now, uh, clearly, I would hope that all the countries would agree to choose this catch-up rate in a way that uh, promotes uh, the catch-up itself in the hope that uh, the Eurozone member countries will move closer together over time. And in a sense, that is a redistributive uh, standpoint, but for a small amount on a progressive basis, uh, I would rather take the risk of being too favorable to the poorer members than the opposite. Okay, then, if there are no more questions, I will thank Jack very much for uh, this uh, interesting presentation. And I thank also Bank Sabadell for uh, giving us the opportunity of uh, sharing some of those uh, Thank you.